Look at Barry. No, they're coming. That's fine. I think one of the themes that um, is important in this kind of valuable time is to recognize that one of the, the topics we've talked about is the dropout. Uh, maybe, Nancy, you could, you could translate this, is the fallout between junior and senior. And as we've discussed many times, Olivia, it's something I'm very passionate about. I believe that um, children and juveniles um, have a lot of support through their moms and dads and volunteers and community, and that's a great thing. And they still need all the support they can get. However, there's a gap, in my opinion, between junior and senior, and I really, really want to focus on that. I mean, if we can. Okay, I'll, I'll translate that and then you kind of introduce the whole topic. Sure, thing. Olivia can take over with the yeah. introductions then, yeah. Bueno, um, Javier, entonces Anton solo quiere um, eh, reconocer que un tema que le, le preocupa y, y quiere discutirlo un poquito a lo largo de la charla es que hay un, um, una reducción eh, de jóvenes que lleva, llegan al siguiente nivel superior en, en el salto alto y pues porque él piensa que los jóvenes tienen más apoyos a través de la familia, diferentes apoyos que después ya cuando llegas a un nivel más alto no se encuentran tan fácilmente, eh, por lo menos a nivel de Irlanda. Y ahora va Olivia a presentar y abrir la charlita. Vale, vale. Vale, vale. Yeah, bienvenidos, uh, Javier. Yeah, no soy encantada. Yeah, Nancy, you'll have to help me. That's, that's about as far as I go. So um, I'm going to put on a little video to share. Hope it didn't work in the last call. Hopefully it works this call. Um, one second. And I'll try and get it. Va a presentar un video. Quizá te lo mandó um, para presentarte en este video cortito que ha armado. La Olivia, a ver si funciona mm. bien. Y lo que no dije antes, Mano, es, me, bueno, después te digo. Sí, hopefully you can hear it now. Um, okay. The sound may not work this time. If it doesn't, I'll put it on the Facebook page. But here we go. Wait a second. Back to the start. Bienvenidos, Javier. Cade me apologize. Good, well done. Exciting. Exciting. <laughs> we all go dance now. We have a party, hey? Yeah. Another Brent's party. Tell have you we have another party. You can you can do with Brendan and Steve Smith again. They're not here, but yeah. So have you just basically to start off, we're going to ask, what was it like for you in Cuba? How did you get into athletics? Why athletics? Why not basketball? And what was it that you loved, especially about high jump? Was it only high jump or did you have other events? Sorry, Nancy, I forgot you to translate all that. <laughs> yeah, so remember to leave me some gaps, but that's okay. Yeah, this, this you get okay. the gist. Yeah. Bueno, Javier, um, Olivia quiere empezar preguntándote cómo, cómo era para ti uh, de niño en Cuba, um, que si el atletismo era popular, qué, qué, te, te, qué te atrayó al... al al salto alto y por qué no otro deporte o quizá si practicabas otros deportes cómo era bueno, sí, el atletismo no es o no era ahora es el más popular del evento más o de los deportes más populares 
Ahí en Cuba el deporte más popular es el béisbol, creo que seguido por el bolse o por bolseo. Y ya entre los, los demás deportes está el voleibol, el atletismo. Es el, creo que el PI está entre los tres cuadros de deporte más populares en Cuba. Eh, y lo que me atrajo a mí del salto a altura, creo que fue más que todo las condiciones, no tanto el gusto. Cuando yo era bien pequeño, que yo comencé el atletismo con 10 años, eh, de todas las disciplinas el salto de, digo, del atletismo, era la que menos me gustaba, porque le tenía miedo, no me gustaba saltar para nada. Me gustaban las carreras, me gustaban las vallas, el salto de longitud. Pero bueno, sin quererlo, en un principio, eh, era de las cinco disciplinas obligatorias para la enseñanza del atletismo en Cuba, cuando tienes 10, 11 años, fue la disciplina que más me fui esperando. Y ya por eso, a partir de los 14, me especialicé en salto alto. Ok, ahí le traduzco. So he says that, um, yeah, athletics isn't um, the number one sport um, in Cuba. Um, as some of you might know, um, baseball is very much the most popular sport. Um, and then there would be things like volleyball. And in the top five is still athletics, but um, it wouldn't have been the top one. But what attracted him very much was like the conditions that you needed to, to do athletics. So at 10 years old, he started in athletics um, and he participated in um, running, in the long, long jump and different things, but he wasn't so uh, attracted first off to the, the high jump because he, he was scared of it. He was scared of it and it took a while, um, but also it's among the, the five uh, disciplines that are obligatory in, in athletics training. So he had to obviously um, take part in the high jump in, as part of his athletics training. And little by little, he, um, he really got into it. So by the age of 14, he was specializing in the high jump. Yeah. Wow. And then at the age 16, you jumped two meters 33. That's amazing. Within two years. How did that happen? Off you go, Nancy. With the Estado 33. ¿Cómo lo lograste? ¿Cómo lo hiciste? Dice porque se me ha ido la señal. Repito. Sí. Hola. Sí, porque la señal se me fue. A sí. ver. La pregunta. A los 16 años ya lograste saltar 2 metros 33. ¿Cómo, lo, ¿Cómo le hiciste? ¿Cómo lograste eso? No sé. No, he's frozen. He's frozen. So for the rest of the people there. Um, he's gone there again. It happened oh, there, there. There's connection problems, clearly. But the big question is, look, early success... Uh, how does it happen, you know, to that level, 233 at 16, I think is extraordinary. It, it was a world <coughs> record for the age. Um, you know, S Steve Smith, Dragutin Topic, also jumped 237 as 19-year-olds. It's not the end-all and be-all, obviously. And so, like we said at the beginning, we're interested in the long-term, the long-term development of athletes. But it is incredible, and it's a mystery what kind of secret sauce, what kind of magic happens that creates such incredible uh, achievement at such a young, delicate age. And if we were to listen to and, and reflect on Stefan Holm last week, where he, you know, he suggested they weren't doing heavy lifting, heavy weights, or any of the really complex stuff at 15, 16, even 17, <laughs> how's the guy jumping 233? I certainly don't know. I'm not sure if any of this- He's back online. He's back online, Great. Anton. Have you Maybe can answer? <laughs> yeah. Off you go, have you? Hola. Yeah. So Nancy, ask him, how did he jump 233 with just two years? You ¿Cómo lograste saltar los dos metros 33 solo a los 16 años? 
yo eh, creo que unido a, primero al talento, creo que fue lo, lo principal que me hizo llegar tan alto. Eh, luego, por supuesto, eh, creo que la, la ansia, la gana de, de llegar siempre alto, desde los 14 años, eh, siempre quise hacerlo muy, 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 muy bien. Y tuve la suerte también de tener un gran entrenador. Y creo que la, 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 la unión de todo eso, mi disciplina, eh, mi voluntad a la hora de los entrenamientos más que todo, mis comportamientos a la hora de competir, creo que fue lo que hizo que, que ya tan, tan temprana edad estuviera saltando tan alto. Bueno, traduzco. Um, Javier says that, well, mainly he definitely puts it down to having some talent with the good combination that he was very tall. So that gave him uh, a big advantage. And he always felt that he wanted to do well at what he tried. So um, yeah, he always put in a lot of effort. He was very disciplined in his training, in his behavior, um, putting um, the training in and definitely having a good trainer from such a young age. And what, did, what, Nancy, what type of training did he do at 16 years of age compared to when he trained, when he broke his first world record in 1988? How much did that differ? Pues, Javier, ¿cómo piensas que uh, variaba el entrenamiento que hacías a los 14 años? Um, para cuando, digo, sí, a los 16 años, cuando saltaste 2.33, um, a cuando obtuviste la, el primer récord mundial uh, en 1988. ¿Qué había cambiado de cómo entrenabas? Bueno, yo tuve la suerte desde los 14 años, eh, hasta que hice mi segundo récord del mundo, ya después falleció mi entrenador, pero bueno, tener en esos tiempos, en esos años, el mismo entrenador. Y creo que lo que fue variar eh, un poco entre año eh, tras año fue eh, los volúmenes más que todo de fuerza los volúmenes más bien de, de salto eh, creo que fue lo más que varió la cantidad de no, la, la cantidad de, de, de ejercicios que íbamos incorporando más que todo los ejercicios de fuerza Y sí, a ver, desde el año 82, que yo pensé, empecé con mi entrenador Godoy, al año 88, sí hubo un incremento bien grande, por, su, por supuesto, siempre gradualmente. Muy bien. So, um, Javier says, he, basically one thing, he was very lucky that he was able to have the same trainer um, over that period, which very much helped and year by year the trainings um, increased but gradually but consistently so his uh, strength training would gradually increase and his height um, the, the amount of height that he was jumping the amount of total exercise in total that he was um, doing was increasing so between 1982 and 1988 um, when he was you know training for that first world record um, with Godoy, his training was increasing gradually, year by year, but there was a big crease, increase in total over that period, which really um, put the whole thing together for him. Thanks, Nancy. I might just um, interrupt here and just tell everybody, Nancy is a very good friend of mine. She's no background in athletics or sport. So all of this talk that we'll be doing about plyometrics, strength and conditioning, it's all new lingo for, for Nancy anyway in English. So be patient. I've tried to prep her in what, what the high jump even is. OK, so thanks, Nancy, for that. So, Nancy, just one quick question. When he was 16, then I'm assuming he wasn't doing weight training. Una pregunta pequeña. Cuando tenías 16 años, entonces, en este primer logro, ¿estabas ya entrenando con pesas? Sí, con 16 años ya. Eh, de, a ver, desde los 14 años, 15 años, comencé a hacer pesas. Ya con los 16 también hacía lo que, a ver, como decía, no hacía la misma cantidad 
y el mismo peso que cuando ya tenía ya 19 o 20 años. So yes, he said he, he was actually already doing some weight training at 14, but nothing close to the amount of weight training that he gradually built up over the years um, to get to 1988. And Tone, do you want to ask, go in there, you love this area, weight training. No, I'm, squats, I'm trying to do the math squats. on what age, he was, what age he was in 1988. Were you, uh, 1988, you probably 18, 20? What age were you at in 1988? Bueno, cuando hice mi primer récord, me faltaba un mes y tanto para cumplir los 21. Quiere decir, con 20 años y 10 meses. He was almost 21. He was one month short of 21 years old. Okay, great. So, can I, can I ask, what did a typical week look like in your preparations in the off season when you were 20 or 21? Anton pregunta si nos puedes decir un poco cómo sería una semana típica eh, en tus entrenamientos en esa época. Bueno, depende de la, de la etapa de entrenamiento. Casi como que la dividíamos en tres partes. No es la misma una semana típica en la etapa de preparación general, la parte general física de nosotros. Otra le llamamos en Cuba ya la etapa especial y a la etapa competitiva la parte ya que es puramente competencia. No es la misma semana en cada una de esas etapas. La etapa, por supuesto, más difícil y más fuerte era la etapa de preparación física, la parte general nuestra. Y una, la combinábamos, yo hacía por lo general eh, tres veces a la semana ejercicio de fuerza. Eh, en ese tiempo hacíamos muchos multisaltos. Ejercicios también, o, o carrera, mejor dicho, de, para la resistencia. Y ya después, por supuesto, oh. eh, incorporamos ejercicios de, en la parte especial. Ejercicios técnicos, ejercicios de rapidez, ejercicios de coordinación. ¿Aló? ¿Me escucha? Hola, hola. Se cortó un poquito. Ya escucho de nuevo. Desde los ejercicios técnicos. De... Allá, en la parte esta especial, hacíamos ejercicios técnicos, ejercicios de coordinación, ejercicios de acrobacia también, ejercicios de rapidez, de velocidad. Bueno, y voy a traducir tapa... eso. Vale, bien. Y después hacemos la competitiva. Um, So um, there's three, uh, depending on what part of the training um, they were at, there was different stages to the training. So basically there would be the stage of general preparation, um, which wasn't um, as close to a competition time. Then they would move into um, special training stages. And then the final stage would be the competitive stage which was I, um, the most intense. Um, so they would have different levels of physical um, exercise. I think in the, in the special training stage, he would already have uh, three times a week um, particular strength exercises that he would be um, carrying out. He would carry out lots of multi-jump exercises, which I hope that translates okay. Probably, yes. He called it multi-jumps, literally, as I'm translating. And um, then there was lots of technical exercises that they would incorporate into this special stage. Um, coordination exercises, acrobacy, uh, acrobatics, I suppose, different types of, and um, speed, different speed exercises to, um, for that. So now he's going to tell me about the competitive stage. Bueno. Well done, Nancy. Well done, Nancy. I'm well learning done. lots. Yeah, we'll get you running next. Yeah. <laughs> Cuéntanos entonces de la etapa competitiva, por favor. Yeah, en, en la etapa competitiva, igual, eh, depende eh, del tiempo antes de la competencia. Yo, cuando iba a saltar, eh, la semana esa sí hacía una 
dos veces ejercicio de fuerza eh, entre una o dos veces ejercicios técnicos me tomaba todo igual una o dos veces al día a la semana eh, descanso pero todo eso lo hacíamos en dependencia del día de la competencia si era el domingo siempre hacíamos como lo mismo eh, cuatro o cinco días antes de competir Muy bien, gracias So, um, the competitive stage well, definitely depended on how many days before the competition um, they had and if it was like if they had a whole week before um, they for the week previous of the competition date, they would have He would train two times in that week with strength exercises, two times with technical exercises, and he'd definitely take um, two days, I suppose, two times of rest. So he'd definitely fit in um, rest days. And um, then if the, ex the, let's say if the competition was on a Sunday, for example, um, the four days prior, um, I think he didn't have as much Uh, of the strong exercises um, incorporated. You did super, Nancy. You did fabulous. There's all <laughs> there's lingo in athletics world for all of that. We we can translate. You did brilliant, Nancy. We'll get you jumping soon. Just to tie <laughs> on there, there's Eamon Harvey has a question here, and I'm going to ask it because we we cause, um, so Eamon wants to know this. You this you'll understand this one, Nancy. It's about PE. We do it in school here as well. So he wants to know, did the fundamentals of his physical education program in school in Cuba give him a good foundation for his athletics? And that's from Eamon. Bueno, tenemos una pregunta de una persona aquí en la charla, Eamon Harvey. Quiere preguntarte si los fundamentos de lo que aprendiste en la escuela en términos de ejercicio físico, um, si eso tú piensas que te ha ayudado también en toda esta el comienzo de tu carrera, digamos. En los fundamentos de los ejercicios físicos que aprendí al, comen al comienzo, sí, claro que siempre, yo creo que tener una buena base desde pequeño siempre va a ayudar eh, para que tenga mejores resultados al final. Y no solo para que tenga más, mejores resultados, sino creo que si la base es buena, no poca ni mucha, ayuda también a, a que el atleta pueda durar muchos años más. En la de, de, de salto. Muy bien. Um, he says that, um, yes, that definitely um, a good base from when he was in school, he thinks is definitely essential for any, any young person um, who will maybe later on go on to, to practice more um, sports at different levels. And um, he says that definitely not too little, but also not too much in terms of how much um, sport you have, because that will help very much for an athlete to get to their best condition and also to be able to last longer in their uh, athletics career or wh whatever sport they choose. Thanks, Nancy. And another question for him, Javier. Um, the coaching structure in Cuba, is there a structure firstly? You've mentioned you've had the same coach all the way through, I think um, Godoy is his name. But is there is there support for juvenile athletes in Cuba as well as senior athletes? And if so, what is it? What what does it consist of? Did you understand that, Nancy? Yeah, I'm just writing it here. Um, la pregunta es sobre cómo está estructurado eh, la parte de entrenamiento y los entrenadores en Cuba. Um, si como qué tipos de apoyos hay y si es um, ¿Es igual o cómo varía entre el entrenamiento y los entrenadores que pueden ofrecerle a, a los juveniles, a nivel juvenil, y los más avanzados? Eh, ¿Cómo, por, por ejemplo, como pudiste tener un buen entrenador constantemente? ¿Esa es parte de cómo estructuran el entrenamiento? We've lost, en him. We've lost oh. him again. We've lost him again. I, okay. saw, I saw him staring at you intensely and I said, he's frozen. We've lost him. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to come oh, back okay. in again. So, Anton, just you can hop in here as well. We're just going through some of those questions on the list, the, the coaching one here. Um, hopefully, you'll come back. Yeah. You know, my view is that, um, you know, 
kids athletics, kids sport, always important. Absolute given that you know kids need a good, well, well ranged, wide range of exposure to sport at a very safe level. Nothing new there. So let's, let's try and really get to the magic of you know how we jump to uh, jump so successfully yeah. for so long at such a high level. I, I don't think there's any doubt about the kids stuff being super important uh, at a structured PE level in school. That's absolutely given. Uh, it needs support, but I don't think caveat. There, he's is... back. He's back now. He's coming in. Bienvenidos, Javier. Yeah. <laughs> Nancy, do you mind if I just tailor that question a little bit? My, Olivia's my last question, question is similar to what Olivia just said, which was the the how different is the preparations and lifestyle of their junior athletes to their senior athletes? Is there a, is there a big change in the way they prepare? Javier, ¿nos escuchas? Sí, es que, que tiene que la conexión va y se viene y va y mira. Bueno, qué bueno, qué bueno, ya veniste. Sí. Bueno, eh, estamos eh, armando una pregunta entre Antón y Olivia. Entonces, eh, Antón quiere saber eh, cómo varía eh, la vida, digamos, de un atleta a nivel juvenil a cuando ya pasa a un nivel más superior. Um, y bueno, Olivia también quería saber un poco de cómo varía eso en términos del, de los apoyos para el entrenamiento para esos dos niveles. Bueno, yo creo que de, de, de un, una fase de juvenil a una fase ya de nivel mayor, eh, creo que uno madura en todos los sentidos, eh, más que todo mentalmente uno madura mentalmente, eh, físicamente también eh, está más preparado y con mucha más experiencia, más que todo para la hora de, de tomar más decisiones a la hora de, de los entrenamientos, de la conciencia y la disciplina que tiene que tener y a la hora igualmente de competir. Creo que si ya uno va año tras año tomando experiencia a la hora de las competencias uno lo, como que lo hace mejor. Y creo que el, el apoyo, por supuesto, no es lo mismo el apoyo que recibe un junior que recibe ya eh, un, una persona mayor, ya o mayor, bueno, no sé cómo le dicen, se pueden decir, pero bueno, ya sí, que tienen señor. un nivel alto, un senior, exacto. Sí, sí. Eh, por lo general, las competencias junior se hacen bastante, tienen apoyo, pero no tanto como la competencia de, de silla. Hay igualmente por parte de los, de los sponsors, por parte de, la, de los clubes, eh, los mismos, hasta los mismos aficionados y seguidores, como que eh, reconocen más los resultados de los niños que los resultados de los juniors. Y creo que sí, eh, la diferencia es notable. Gracias. So yes, um, well, definitely the difference between the, like juvenile level and senior is is big and it varies a lot. Um, firstly, um, maturity level. Um, just um, you mature in lots of different ways, but definitely mentally is very important and a big difference that you gain much more mental maturity as you become a senior and physically as well. Um, you're more prepared and definitely with just more experience of the years behind you, um, it makes a big difference um, in making decisions during your training sessions. You're more conscious um, about how you're training and obviously in the competitions themselves when you're com competing, you have a lot more experience and maturity. And then in terms of the supports, um, that the difference between the juvenile and the senior level, well, yeah, there is a lot of supports for the ju juvenile level that um, he would have had, um, but it definitely um, increases a lot for senior level. So the difference is very notable. Um, there's the clubs are offering different types of supports. There's sponsors involved. The fans, even the fans recognition of the results of senior level is much more than for juniors. And so that really um, 
builds and adds to the, the supports around um, a senior level athlete. Thanks, Nancy. You're, you're playing a blinder. Um, ask him this one now, Nancy. When did he start using uh, sports psychologists? I see there's great YouTube videos of how that brought him to his 245 world record. So at what age was he when he, and how, what age was he when he started using them? And how much did it affect his jumping, does he think or feel? Bueno, sabe, ha visto algunos videos de cuánto has podido usar sí, psicólogos de, para deportes. Y Olivia quiere saber, um, bueno, ¿a qué edad empezaste a en, entrenar con psicólogos también para ayudarte en el deporte? ¿Y um, cómo qué efectos, cómo, cuánto efecto le, te ha ayudado en, en tu deporte? Bueno, allá en Cuba nosotros tenemos eh, la suerte, digo, desde de, de que cuando empezamos la, las preselecciones nacionales que se hace junior o senior, bueno, desde que empezamos desde jóvenes, eh, tenemos, le decimos, al lado de cada atleta, no, a ver, por ejemplo, el área de salto, de salto tiene dos o tres médicos, doctores digo, tiene dos o tres fisios y tiene uno o dos psicólogos que atiende a todos los saltadores. Así mismo sucede con velocidad, con los lanzamientos, con el área de fondo, eventos múltiples. Y yo tuve la suerte de tener desde casi los 16 años el mismo psicólogo hasta el año, desde el año casi 84 hasta el 2001 que me retiré. Quiere decir que fue Gustavo, un, un psicólogo que me conocía a plenitud. Y no creo que todos los... A ver, siempre va a ser beneficioso, es lo que pienso yo. Pero no por igual para cada uno. Porque no todos lo... No es que lo necesiten, creo que para mí lo necesitamos todos. Lo que no todos tienen la misma conciencia de la necesidad del psicólogo. Y por eso, aquellos que no tienen conciencia de la necesidad del psicólogo, no va a surgir o, va, o no va a tener el mismo efecto que aquellos que sí están conscientes de que son necesarios. En el caso mío sí me ayudó muchísimo. Eh, en momentos, no solo en momentos en que estuve eh, lesionado, en momentos en que estuve alejado de las pistas, de los entrenamientos, sino en momentos también creo que, que estaba en última forma. Ya, yeah. gracias. Creo que siempre, siempre tuve la, 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 la ayuda y me, creo que para mí eh, pues. oh. se cortó Javier, pero traduzco hasta ahí. ¿Me escucha? Sí. I'll, I'll start translating. Se paró un poquito. Sí, sí, sí. Voy a traducir y, y puedes seguir un poquito. So, um, yeah, in Cuba, um, says we're lucky enough to have, um, when we're already being pre-selected nationally um, for our sports, um, every um, athlete, athlete um, every athletic area is... Um, has supports from about two to three doctors, two to three physios, and one or two psychologists um, for every one of those. So basically that he would have had a team available to him for just all the, the people doing the jumps um, of that two, three doctors, two, three physios, one or two psychologists. So, so he was 16 and he was able to um, work with a psychologist and was lucky enough to have the same psychologist as well who knew him very well year after year obviously till 1984 and um, that was Gustavo and that that well the relationship over a long time was very beneficial in that sense too um, because it's always beneficial he thinks to be able to have a, a psychologist um, accompanying the athletes, but it might not be the same of the same benefit for everyone because um, not everyone is as conscious of how important um, the psychological aspect can be. 
So that different level of consciousness um, will vary, obviously, with everyone. And some people might not be as convinced that it's necessary to have that support as well. And when, when he was injured or away from the competition um, in different moments that he couldn't compete, um, those were moments that um, having his psychologist there was very helpful as well. And that's where it got cut off. And Javier got cut off as well, but I've just admitted him again. And I'm just looking to see if I can... I oh, have him. You're back, Javier. Yeah. yeah. Bienvenidos, Javier. <laughs> una más, una más, bienvenidos. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> se, ha, se cortó cuando decías que tu psicólogo pues ayudó mucho en momentos que estabas lesionado o cuando no podías competir. Hasta ahí llega, llegué yo. Exacto. Bueno, decía que a mí me ayudó mucho, más que todo en esos momentos de lesiones que estuve mucho tiempo eh, alejado de las pistas, sin poder entrenar, sin poder saltar. Pero igual creo que también el momento en que estaba en últimas condiciones, él ya creo que me conocía eh, bien, buscaba hasta frases eh, de que no me dijera ni él mismo. Hay cosas que yo conocí después de retirado que mandaba al, al que era presidente de la federación nuestra, a mi mismo entrenador, a compañeros míos del, del deporte, a decir, dígale, dile esto a Soto Mayor, dile esto de tal forma, dile esto así, y me ayudó muchísimo. Gracias. So, not only did my trainer help when I was in moments of having been injured or not being able to compete, but um, he also helped me obviously in moments when I was in, in good condition. And even after I, have, I retired, um, he was still very aware of communicating with me and um, through our federation, um, through different um, athletes, um, he would be sure to have people, um, I think he sent like kind of motivating phrases and things. So he'd, he'd make sure that everyone was still supporting each other and communicating with Javier and basically still, um, still staying in contact and being supportive after his retirement. Which is great. And Tone, you have a load of questions, yeah? Are you with us still? And Tone, are you that. still here? Well, I think we might have lost Tone. Yeah. Tone, no, have no, we no, lost I'm you? Here. No, you're there. No, no, I'm here. And Nancy, okay. can you hear me clearly? Yes. Great. So uh, just building on that previous answer, um, my question is, people like Jose Godoy and his coach in, after 1992, uh, De La Torre, I think was his name, um, and also those doctors, physios, psychologists, they obviously work at a high performance level. They obviously have a lot of, they're obviously the best at what they do, the best coaches, best doctors, best physios, I'm guessing. So how do you how do you um, reward those people, incentivize those people and allow access for the young guys to those high level support people? And how, how do you educate those high level coaches, for example? So I, I'm just what I'm trying to get at is the team element, the team of great coach, great physio, great doctor, great agent, manager, whatever. How do you structure that? And possibly, I'm guessing, because of Jose Godoy, is there, and maybe the communist thing in Cuba, is there any connections with Russia and the intelligence from uh, their coaches in Eastern Europe and Russia? It's a long question, I know, but I can clarify. <laughs> you want it all. You want it all, Anton, I know. <laughs> okay. It's about the expertise. In a nutshell, it's about the expertise. How do they develop it and how do they allow access to it? Pues, siguiendo con el mismo tema, um, Anton quiere saber, pues... Ya sabemos un poquito de su, tu entrenador Godoy y después um, estuviste con De La Torre. Todos estos especialistas en su área, los psicólogos, los doctores, um, pues cómo son los incentivos, um, cómo se les motiva y cómo se les puede dar acceso a estos especialistas, a los más jóvenes en, en el atletismo. Cómo se puede educar eh, como este espíritu de, de equipo para crear un elemento de equipo fuerte. Y por último, si, 
de alguna manera se prestan algunas um, ideas de cómo eh, Rusia y sus entrenamientos también de deportistas o del este de Europa tal vez se han incorporado, incorporado ideas desde allí también? Bueno, yo digo que eh, no sé cómo se trabaja en cada uno de los lugares. El caso de Cuba, que es lo que yo puedo hablar, eh, teníamos un equipo de, de médico, masajista, psicólogo, entrenador. No se hacía nada por, por separado. Todo se hacía en conjunto. Todo se hacía en equipo. Cada cosa que, que, que el entrenador quería, lo, primero lo, se lo comunicaba o lo, o lo discutía con el doctor. Lo, se discutía también con el, con el psicólogo. Los días también que había de masaje y eso, todo eso era planificado no es que el masajista de Gaby decía Soto, vamos a hacer esto sin el entrenador tener conocimiento o el doctor de tomar X vitamina sin el entrenador tener conocimiento o una sección con el psicólogo sin el entrenador tener conocimiento ¿me escucha? Sí, 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 perfecto um, So, I can Hola. Sí I Hola. Can... Sí te escucho se fue para él. Se ha ido de nuevo la señal. Ay, ay, ay. Mucho. Ah. We can hear you. I mean, ya no sé qué habló. Espera, vamos a tener que contar, mirar de nuevo. Se <ríe> está cayendo la señal. Ah. Voy, voy a traducir mientras regresas. Ay, ay, ay. Well, so, um, I can mostly talk for Cuba, because it's what I know. Um, but basically, we had one team. And we always worked as one team. Nothing was separate. Um, it was all teamwork. Everything was communicated between all the specialists. Um, the trainer, our trainer would definitely be communicating with the doctor the whole time, with the psychologist. Um, an athlete wouldn't have a session with their psychologist without the trainer knowing about it. Even the massage days would be planned out. Everything was communicated. People wouldn't be taking vitamins without consulting with the doctor, the trainer, etc. So it was all a very much a team effort the whole time with lots of communication. Fantastic. That's a really good um, nugget of information. I mean, it sounds, I mean, again, full respect to the political system, but it's centralized, it's coordinated, and it's, uh, it's very much the oneness. You know what I'm talking about here? I mean, that's a that's the theme of communism. It's it's oneness thing. But you know, if you've got the best, then people don't work in the background with you know alternative alternative methodologies. It seems to be centralized. Am I right in saying that? Like if you've got the best physio, the best coach, then they say, Okay, why don't you? I mean, is there intervention if they see a talented athlete with potentially a coach who's damaging the athlete? Is there intervention? And do you have to work with the recommended centralized high performance team that he mentioned? Is he back? Because that, that's yeah, controversial in the UK. Do you know what he's I'm talking back, about, Nancy? Yeah. Just say it's the last bit again. Controversial. I'm sorry? The intervention part, say again? It's a controversial topic, right? If you've got a team of experts, right, which the Federation approves of, But mm -hmm. then you've got athletes in the background, maybe a talented athlete who's working with mm -hmm. a coach who's overzealous, right? Maybe egotistical or whatever, you know, wants to protect their athlete so much, but really they're doing stuff that's not appropriate. Mm. What happens in Cuba in that situation? Yeah. Okay. That's common. That's very common. Um, pues una pregunta para seguir con eso. Um, nos pregunta Anton que bueno, le parece muy interesante lo que has estado diciendo ahí, le gusta la idea de tener como un equipo muy centralizado, muy comunicador y lo que quiere saber es entonces um, si se puede puede haber situaciones a donde quizá un entrenador um, quizá no esté haciendo lo mejor para uh, su atleta y um, aunque otros expertos en el equipo um, tengan sus dudas de lo que están manejando en términos de sus entrenamientos y todo, ¿hay momentos de que pueda haber una intervención um, o se maneja muy así centralizado de que todo el equipo 
eh, tiene voz para poder eh, bueno, manejar esa situación. Sí, a ver, se nos hacen eh, el doctor, el fisio, el psicólogo que trabajan juntos, eh, nos van haciendo pruebas eh, periódicamente. Y esas pruebas dan ciertos niveles para saber si los entrenamientos van manchando bien. Y eso, por supuesto, cada uno de esos resultados se la va diciendo al entrenador. Y se está diciendo, a lo mejor, este, este segmento muscular está débil, eh, necesita a lo mejor fortalecer eh, esta, esta cosa, o, lo, o este, este plano muscular, o, o está muy lento, los niveles estos están dando que está muy lento, o está demasiado fuerte. El psicólogo le puede decir, no está motivado, eh, está ansioso, y son cositas así que entre, entre todo ello se va trabajando. Perfecto. Um, well, one thing that would, we would do is that the, there would be periodical tests being carried out on the, the athletes. So this would help to feed into um, the analysis that the doctors would be doing on the athletes and they would be measuring their muscle work um, Their, well, the types of trainings that they're doing to see if particular levels that they're reaching are too high or too low. And these would all be fed back, obviously, to the trainer. The psychologist could be feeding back that their motivation right now is low and they need to work on that. So all those things would be fed back and uh, the trainer would use them really to, to improve their, um, the, whole, the whole training that they're receiving. My, my final question before we can, I'm happy to go to other people is, again, sit building on that does he find there's resistance to that i mean are there coaches who say no no i don't want to do this i don't want to do that and they think maybe they know it all and secondly why are the current generation of cuban jumpers or athletes in general struggling in comparison to the previous generations he's gone so one minute was, he's coming back this was similar in sweden and also ireland maybe that There, right now, there seems to be maybe more distraction or maybe more life demands. Maybe it's an economic factor. People need to go to work or something. But what's the difference between that generation of great Cuban athletes and 30 years later? And also, is there resistance to best practice? Or are people open-minded? Okay. Is he back? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, wait, I'll double check. He hopped out. He'll have been again now. Just I'm... Okay. Fighting with well, he's gone off again. He's gone off again. Oh, yeah. I see him, but it's stuck. Uh, Hello, Javier, ¿nos escuchas? Well, he's there, oh. yeah. Sí. Pues Anton va a preguntar una pregunta más. Um, él quiere saber si, pues, si hay resistencia a veces de los entrenadores um, al recibir la información técnica um, que pueden dar todo el equipo. Um, a poder um, lograr esta mejor práctica con los atletas. Um, sí, sí, hay resistencia a veces de los entrenadores um, para incorporar eso. Y también, ¿qué ves como, qué es lo que ha cambiado? ¿Qué nuevos factores quizá hay en cómo los atletas cubanos ahorita um, están, qué están logrando a lo que estaban logrando hace 30 años, ya que ha, ha habido un... un um, un declive y qué factores piensas que están eh, afectándoles? A ver, eh, en cuanto a, a que el entrenador se niegue, creo que en Cuba es un poco difícil que el entrenador se niegue porque semanalmente se hacen unos pequeños sequeos y, y hay que eh, como, un, como especie de un expediente que se hace atleta por atleta y tienes que informar cómo está físicamente, cómo está la parte de ciclo del médica. Bueno, se discute hasta la parte docente, la parte de los estudios. Eso es semanalmente, atleta por atleta. Y entonces por eso es que tiene que estar ligado entrenador, atleta, médico, masajista, psicólogo. Y creo que es muy difícil que el entrenador se, se rehúse. Y creo que en, en comparación a 30 años atrás, eh, lo más que nos está afectando a nosotros creo que es la parte económica antes teníamos eh, mejores materiales bueno, no, no es que sean mejores que los actuales pero sí casi al nivel que lo tenía el mundo entero teníamos más mítines nacionales 
más mítines internacionales también, más que todo para los jóvenes. Hoy en día los jóvenes en Cuba compiten muy poco, más que todo a nivel internacional. Y creo que el factor principal por el cual Cuba no está al nivel de hace 20, 30 años es por cuestiones más que todo, razones económicas. Para suerte nuestra, siempre tenemos eh, buenos talentos, que son los que hoy en día hacen que Cuba, por lo menos en los mundiales, en las olimpiadas, todavía siga consiguiendo medallas. Muy bien, gracias. Um, well, in Cuba, um, it would be quite difficult um, for a trainer to um, resist um, in the way that Anton was asking and try to do, to, to resist the best practice that's being um, offered. Um, and basically this is down to the fact that there is a weekly, there's weekly checkups done up on all the, the senior level athletes and they basically do a report on a weekly basis for every single athlete. And this includes everything from their medical state to their mental health, um, what the massage and the masseuse reports back, and even their education. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Or is it yes. coming yeah. out? I'd love to know yeah. what David thinks about that yeah, when you're finished. Tells me it's yeah. unstable. More. So basically, this report is a very thorough report that's um, done up on a weekly basis. And so it would be quite difficult for a coach to be um, going against the, all these um, factors that are reported from all the other specialists. And in terms of what's changed, what, what's happened in Cuba um, in the last 30 years, um, it really, he thinks it comes down to economic factors. Um, Before, about 30 years ago, we were up to scratch with the same types of material um, equipment and everything that we needed um, for athletes, but our, the economic situation um, doesn't really allow for young uh, competitors, young athletes to go to as many international meetings. Um, so they're just not out on the world stage as much as what they would have been maybe 30 years ago. And this is really affecting um, that part of the performance. But in general, um, he says that there's a lot of talent in Cuba um, that's still there, but yeah, the economic factors have affected. Can it, can, there's a lot of questions coming in here and the, there seems to be a repetition. And the big question is the 245, the world record. Firstly, how did what did it feel like to clear it? Um, what someone has said here, um, do you, does he think was that his limit? When will it be broken? Who's his favorite jumper at the moment? Who's his, what's, you know, can do you understand what I mean, Nancy? I think so. Yeah. Um, He's the world record holder, Nancy, in the high jump. Yeah. I know. <laughs> well, only as of the last few days, but I'm very excited about that now. Um, bueno. Olivia pregunta, hay unas preguntas que están preguntando en el chat y quieren saber mucho sobre tu gran logro, obviamente de los 2 metros 45, eh, cómo se sintió lograr ese gran eh, récord que hasta hoy sigue y eh, cuándo piensas que quizá lo van a poder romper y ¿Quién sería um, tu atleta de salto alto favorito ahorita? Bueno, el... Me sentí, por supuesto, cuando lo batí el récord del mundo muy, muy bien, muy contento. Y creo que fue un honor. Pero de los sentimientos así, de, de la alegría mayor que haya sentido, lo sentí más cuando hice 2.43 que 2.45. El 2.43 porque fue la primera vez que lo hice. Y el 2.44, el 2.45, como que estaba, eh, no seguro, porque seguro de nada, pero un poco eh, como que sabía de que podía lograrlo. Y por supuesto me emocioné, me sentí bien, me sentí contento, agradecido por supuesto. Eh, pero el 2.43 fue cuando más me emocioné, en el salto como el primer récord mundial. Eh, de categoría mayor porque antes hice también otro récord para otras categorías eh, ¿cuándo se va a batir el récord? es algo bien difícil 
de, de predecir. En el año 88 nunca pensé, cuando hice mi primer récord, de que iba a durar tanto yo como recordista del mundo. Ya después, bueno, han pasado varios años, ya voy a cumplir eh, 33 años como recordista. Porque el primero fue el 88, pero bueno, el último fue en el año 93. Y decir igual quién, tampoco lo sé. Estuvo muy, 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 muy cerca, primero Bodarenko y después Marchín. Creo que ambos han hecho intentos a los 2.46 muy bueno, bien cercano a poder lograrlo y decirte quién es mi atleta favorito eh, en estos últimos tiempos Marcin ha sido más estable ahora mismo decir quién puede ser el favorito para Tokio no es difícil decir quién porque no sé las condiciones que está Marcin todavía lleva un tiempo sin competir y los demás saltadores dentro de ellos Saya el cubano están bien parejos. Perdón, ¿cuál es el nombre del cubano? Perdón. Sayas. 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 Okay. Um, right. I hope I get. Uh, you're going to help me with the athletes' names because I definitely don't know my athletes. But um, yeah. So when when he got the 2:45 world record, which still holds. Um, He says, I felt really happy and very honored, but really uh, and truthfully, the most emotional one for me was really the, the 243 jump. Um, I was much more ecstatic when I reached that um, record um, at 2 meters 43 um, because it was uh, my first big um, uh, record. And It wasn't that I was totally sure that I would get to the 245 record, but I knew I could achieve it more. So um, obviously I was very emotional when I got it and I was very grateful and honored. Um, um, but yes, definitely the 243 was, I was much more ecstatic at that point. And I definitely never thought it would last so long in 88. I, never knew that it would still be holding 33 years later. Um, and now these are the names that I'm not sure of. Um, Varenko and Martin, how do you pronounce them? You're doing great. We'd, we'd struggle with them too. You're doing great. So basically two uh, high jumpers who were very close to his attempts. Um, Varenko and Mar Barchin or Martin, I'm not sure. Barchin. Barchin. Yeah, because in, in Spanish Barcine. accent, yeah, Barcine. Barcine. so he, he admired their very good attempts um, to try to break his record. And in terms of his favorites, it's hard to say, but um, uh, Varchin, Varchan, he feels Varchin is the most stable of one of the, the jumpers that he would see, but he doesn't quite know what condition he's in, perhaps right now for Tokyo. Um, but he's also... Um, looking towards the, the Cuban, he's, he's the Cuban Sayas Sa 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 is one of his favorites as well. Right. And wait, does he coach, is he, is he, he's coaching himself now at the moment, have you? Ahorita estás eh, entrenando a otros atletas? Estoy entrenando a tres chicas en Cuba. Ah, muy bien. He is actually training three women right now in Cuba. Wow. High jumpers, obviously, yeah. Salto alto, sí. Sí, sí claro. And how, how does he find coaching? Is coaching very different to jumping? Being a jumper? Eh, ¿Cómo encuentras ahora eh, ser entrenador? Eh, ¿Qué te parece? ¿Cómo son las diferencias entre entrenar y obviamente competir? A ver, la diferencia es, es grande eh, y más cuando uno quiere que sus atletas hagan lo mismo o igual o parecido a como lo hacía yo. So yeah, it's obviously a huge difference and um, it's it's difficult because obviously I would like them to do as much as I have managed to do. 
Mm. So how does he cope wow. with that? Yeah. Um, y pues, ¿cómo, ¿cómo le haces con eso de, de haber tenido tantos logros y poder entrenarles todavía? Pues, ¿cómo le haces? ¿Cómo le haces? Oh, he's gone again. <laughs> We've lost him again. No worries. Yeah. yeah. Nancy, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I'd like to ask a question we put to Stefan Holm, which was, you know, a very simple question, but three critical success factors. Um, yeah, for his, for his elite athletes, uh, particularly around the special preparation he talked about, which was the core heavy training. He talked about speed, strength, plyometrics, that's jumping exercises. Can you ask him, like, just simply, what are the top three most important things? Stefan Holm said it was about keeping injury free, right? For me, I mean, Paul McKee would appreciate this. It's like in golf, keeping out of the rough, right? If you end up in the rough, you're going to add to your, your score so much. So um, what are the three most important critical success factors in the preparation of, of your international athletes in the, in the heavy training period? He's back, Nancy. Bienvenidos. Have you? <laughs> De nuevo. Um, just one quick comment for Olivia. Um, I don't know if you wanted to ask maybe about the, the, the women's training that you think he was talking about training oh, yeah, uh, it, women it, athletes. Yeah, I, I, you can tie it in there with Antone's. Antone's question is very good there about... Mm, true. So you can tie it in, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, ¿Me escucha, sí? Sí, sí. <laughs> ok, vamos a lograrlo. Ay, ay. <laughs> pues Anton eh, quiere preguntarte, pues... Que es una pregunta que le hicieron a, en la semana pasada a, a Stefan Holm también, sobre cuáles serían unos tres factores críticos para, pues, para llegar a este nivel de atletismo para ti. Um, ¿Cuáles cuál cuál es enfocarías tú? Y, Pero, bueno, ¿en atletismo, en, ¿Atletismo en sentido general? No, no, yo creo que, um, bueno... Did you mean Anton for athletics in general or high jump? No, no. So you have an elite athlete, maybe 20, 22 years of age, in the heavy period of training. What are the three most important success factors for general athletics? Then no, high jump, high jump, high jump, high, high jump. jump. Okay, okay. okay. No, 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 Um, tres factores críticos para entrenarse, para lograr. A ver, es lo que deben hacer o lo que deben tener. Que no entendí. A ver, lo que debe tener, el, un buen saltador de altura o lo que debe entrenar. Pues él me puso ejemplo como de fuerza, velocidad, pliometría. Entonces yo creo que en qué ah, tiene que entrenar, ah. ¿no? Uh -huh. A ver, yo creo que un, un, para ser un buen saltador tiene que tener para mí tres cosas importantes. Una buena potencia, que la potencia está la rapidez y la fuerza. Tiene que ser técnico y tiene que ser fuerte mentalmente. Ok. Um, so... He's saying for to be a good uh, high jumper, he thinks that there's three important things that they need to have. Now, so I think he's talking about more characteristics right now. Um, he thinks that they need to really have good speed and strength. They need to have good technical ability and they need to really have um, yeah. Yeah. mental strength. Mm -hmm. cool. But would you like, is that enough or would you like me to ask what they need to, Focus more um, on. Yeah, look, I think that's a good answer. Uh, you, I mean, we know that an attitude is important and the psychology is very important. We talked about it with Stefan Holm. Um, I guess if you consider it like a pot and you're, you're cooking a meal that, and there's a recipe and you've got maybe 20 ingredients in the recipe, the question was, yeah, probably maybe if there was some technical insights, yeah, technique is super important, but... Um, Yeah, characteristics are useful, but maybe there's somebody else like 
David or Barry Pender has a question that is a bit more about conditioning. The conditioning is really important, obviously. The battle is won before the war. So what goes on in the battle, you know, when you're in the deep depth of winter, winter when you're preparing, what, what is so important? I mean, some people think it's, it's diet. Some people think it's uh, the um, power to weight ratio, elastic strength. Some people think it's having a squad, a team of athletes who work together and you get the synergy. Other people think it's uh, something else, like whatever. But yeah, I think he's answered the question from a characteristics perspective, but maybe someone else might want to tailor the question. Solo pues, Anton, um, si le parece muy, muy interesante lo que dice este término de características importantes y le va a abrir a, si alguien quiere, quiere más um, um, poner otra pregunta, um, ya que pues hay mucha discusión sobre cuáles son como los los elementos claves para la receta perfecta, digamos, para ser buen atleta a nivel élite, de que si es la dieta, oh, is he gone again? He's gone again. He's coming back. Don't worry, he's knocking on the door. <laughs> you're oh. in, have you? You're in. He'll be Bienvenidos. Dizzy. He'll be dizzy. He'll be dizzy. Yeah. Bienvenidos, Javier. Ya estarás mareado, pobre. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> Esta tecnología, ay, ay, ay. Um, <laughs> ahí vamos. Pues, solo Anton decía que algunos dicen que es más importante lo de tener un equipo sólido, otros más la dieta, otros el, el, el nivel de um, peso a poder que tiene un atleta. Y va a, a ver si otros quieren preguntar algo sobre, pues, cuál es la receta perfecta para sacar un buen atleta a nivel élite. Um, y, pues, una cosa antes, um, Olivia um, preguntaba sobre su entrenamiento ahí con, con atletas mujeres y también iba a añadir que si encuentras diferencias entre entrenar Um, atletas, bueno, para salto alto, mujeres que con hombres. ¿Qué diferencias hay ahí? So I was just adding in the last bit from before. I got you, Nancy. I heard it. Um, so to add in on training women athletes for the high jump. Um, Ahora se escucha mal de Solo estoy traduciendo para la audiencia, para que sepan un segundo. ¿Se escucha? ¿Mal? So just... What differences there might be to training women athletes to men athletes if he has encountered any differences? ¿No se escuchas? ¿Me escuchas tú? Sí. Entonces, solo responder diferencias de entrenar mujeres atletas con hombres. Hmm. Frozen. Yeah, but in the, probably. in the meantime, maybe Anton, I don't know if there's questions in the chat. There are. There's lots. I have a lot of questions here in the chat. Um, well, we could, yeah. we could give, I mean, Soto a little bit of a breather if you want to just create he's, a bit of an open forum. He, he's, wait a sec, I think he's back in. Hey, bienvenidos, Soto. <laughs> <laughs> una vez, una vez, eh? So... <laughs> A ver, ¿escuchaste la última parte? Decía, la pregunta al final no la escuché. No, ¿Qué diferencias? No, no escuché bien. ¿Qué diferencias habrás encontrado de entrenar a mujeres atletas con hombres, quizá? ¿O hay alguna? A ver, que creo que la, la diferencia, no, no creo que, que, que hay alguna. Es solo saber, hay ejercicios que tiene que saber que se le está poniendo a una mujer y otros ejercicios que no soportan tanto como los hombres, como más que todos los mismos ejercicios de fuerza, algunos que otros ejercicios de, de los mismos multisaltos, como quiera que sea, no es lo mismo la cantidad de entrenamiento que soporta un hombre a lo que soporta una mujer, y es ser consciente de eso. Okay, so the, there's not really that much difference other than I'm very aware of the fact that I would be 
um, giving out different amounts of exercise in, and different levels of exercise in terms of the strength abilities of women to men, the, the multi jumps, which I know has another term, but that's the direct translation and different quantities of the different types of training exercises, um, which would definitely be different. But apart from that, the training would be um, quite similar. Brilliant, Nancy. Um, Nancy, this is a specific high jump question. So if you don't get it, I'll try, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it for you here, yeah? Okay. So, <laughs> um, so Javier has a particular run-up style, extra strong, stride, long strides. Is that, was that intentional from a biomechanical perspective? Um, and did he, when, for his run-up, this is from Brendan Riley, Brendan Riley's question, he was like, mm. was he working on his rhythm and on the curve and on the lift? Because his, his run-up is particularly unique. And he, he also has a short approach. He sometimes does a short approach. So you could, if you could just ask him about his run-up, his approach to the bar, that'd be great. A ver, is he gone again? He popped out. He popped out again. Oh I'll, take this up. I'll take this chance just for a second or two if he's not there, just to say he has an unorthodox technique in some ways. I mean, the Irish would find it very different. Huge, long, rangy strides. He doesn't arch his back, or he didn't back in there when he was at his peak. Mm -hmm. he, he was flat over the bar. So I think, I mean, you can take confidence in that, that you don't have to have the perfect technique. But again, I keep going back to what are the critical success factors then? If you don't need to arch your back like Bar Shim and you don't, I mean, I remember Stefan, uh, one of the Stefan said to me once, there was a Steiner Hohn said to me once, he said, those long range strides are ridiculous. They're a waste of energy. They don't generate speed. He's, like he's back speed. now. He's back, Anton. Cool. Bienven yeah. Sorry, Anton. Bienvenidos, Javier. Yeah. A ver. Que se incorpore el sonido. Wait a second, is he there? He's gone again, maybe. Hola. He, he might want to exit pretty soon as well, so we need yeah. to be mindful and respectful of his time. But just going to yeah. finish that sentence. His technique was unorthodox. He, I hope he answers the question, but the point is that it's encouraging for people who do have unorthodox approaches, but still, as much as you can not do certain things like maybe arch your back you know or not use a double arm shift he does some things which are absolutely critical like accelerating to the bar but i think barry's question was about the long strides and why yeah i can see he's hanging here in the in the he's neither in with us or out in the waiting room he's probably hanging for a beer because it's friday night <laughs> he's in he's he's hanging here so he's yeah. joining it says he's joining yeah, I remember Brendan's question as well as how he um, how he did it differently in the rain as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was in Crystal Palace in '94 when he jumped two meters forty off a short approach. I think it was like a five side straight approach or something, and he jumped two forty. And Brendan wanted to know how the hell did he do that? So <laughs> he oh, he's coming in from another computer now. Well done. Oh, yeah. by Jesus. <laughs> His head must be wrecked to trying to log in and log out. <laughs> Livy, how do you reckon we should play in the... Here, the he's final? here now. Yeah, I, I, I have it here. But bienvenidos, Javier. So to my... Yeah. <laughs> Groundhog yeah. Day. Groundhog Day. Bienvenidos. He's with us, Nancy. Yeah. Off you go. Approach. We're on about the approach. Si se escucha, si? Si. Si, si. Ok, pues tenemos una pregunta un poco técnica, entonces a ver si mi vocabulario me entiendes un poquito, ya que no soy técnica ni atleta. Eh, Anton, quiere preguntarte sobre, creo que se dice su, tu acercamiento antes de hacer el salto, ¿no? Y por qué pues tienes una técnica de tomar pasos bien largos en el acercamiento antes de saltar y que si tiene alguna razón biomecánica, si se ha analizado, que, que, cómo es eso, y cómo usas tú el ritmo, la curva y la elevación también en, en toda tu técnica para saltar. A ver, eh, el acercamiento mío de los pasos largos, más bien era porque es característica propia mía. Soy un saltador que corro así, lo corría así y lo hacía lo más natural posible. Y lo que intentaba es que, el, más que todo, la aproximación 
hacerla lo más rápido posible. Es lo que intentaba eh, tratar de imprimir la mayor velocidad en, en independencia de la característica mía a la aproximación final. Pero los pasos largos era porque era característica mía, no todos los saltadores eh, ni todos los corredores. No, 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 no tiene la misma amplitud de paso eh, Luis Ambol que otro saltador, digo, que otro corredor. Y, y el caso de, de creo que lo, lo mejor que yo tenía era la hora de la, de la batida, la potencia con que yo batía. En el vuelo, encima de la varilla, la hora que, que franqueaba el listón, no era lo mejor para, eh, que yo hacía. Y entonces, lo que, a diferencia de muchos saltadores, de alquearse mucho, de doblarse mucho en el listón, lo que trataba es de, encima del listón subir la cadera muy bien a ver terminaste con subir la cadera ¿se cortó o así está bien? a ver no sé cómo le dicen ustedes ¿Subir la no, no, cadera está... o subir la cintura? Sí, sí, no, no, está bien. Solo no sabía si se cortó parte de la frase. Perfecto. Voy a, voy a traducir. Pues, so, in my approach style, um, it's very much my style to have the long strides and it's not the usual, obviously, for, for, high, um, for high jumpers. Um, but I try to make it the most natural possible um, but it's definitely my own style. Um, I, my, the last part of my approach, I always tried to make it as fast as possible. And that was my, my characteristic as well. Um, in terms of when I, I'm actually over the bar, in flight over the bar, um, I usually didn't um, do an arch. Um, like um, I didn't use the curve as most Uh, high jumpers would but instead my technique was to lift my hips when I was above the bar at that point I hope that was okay and understandable yeah, yeah that's very good Nancy yeah and would he now would he looking back is there does he have any regrets would he have changed anything you know um does he still jump today as a master three questions Nancy bueno ya estamos casi terminando para que sepas que estamos al final. Una preguntita de Olivia es, pues entonces, hoy en día, eh, bueno, primero, ¿tendrías um, algo que hubieras hecho diferente? ¿Algo eh, que cambiarías en cómo, cómo has hecho las cosas? Y pues si todavía saltas hoy, eh, quieren saber si ya como un máster todavía saltas. A ver, eh, creo que hubiera hecho todo, todo eh, igual. Me refiero yo en cuanto a los entrenamientos. Creo que tuve la suerte de tener buenos entrenadores. Fui un atleta eh, muy disciplinado pues, eh, en mis entrenamientos, que lo hice siempre a máximo nivel. Me refiero con mucha velocidad, sí. digo, con mucha eh, dedicación. Y creo que en ese sentido lo lo haría igual y no, no hoy en día no, no salto yeah, yeah. ¿Sí? no porque no pueda sino por temor a una lesión como llevo muchos años sin hacerlo y como no me preparo no estoy preparado para eso por eso no lo intento muy bien um, well in terms of what I've achieved in athletics um, I think I would do it pretty much the same way um, I would I would do the trainings the same way. I was a very disciplined athlete. Um, I always worked to the maximum level, um, the very fast. Um, and yeah, I basically, I think I would do it all the same way for what I've been able to achieve. And right now, no, I don't jump anymore, but mostly because I haven't trained and therefore I'd really be afraid of, of an injury at this point. Fabulous, Nancy. Fabulous. Um... If there are still more questions, ask him, is he, is, does he need to leave soon? We do have more questions, but 
he's gone. Maybe he's gone already again. Yeah, we'll or see maybe if he comes we'll back. Tell him if five minutes when he comes back, okay. yeah, you can ask him. He's he's gone off. He's gone off screen there again because it's yeah. it's ten thirty. We don't want to be taking the piss here because uh, we don't want to be exploiting him too much. As he said that he's invite him to Ireland. Yeah, and it, yeah. It's, it sounds like he's the kids are going to bed there in the background as well. I could see him getting up and closing the door. So we might have lost him now already at this stage <laughs> if the kids are That's too tired. So, so what I was going to suggest, Anton, just to, to, we can wrap it up with him with some of the questions here. There are quite a few in the chat box, but I would like, I was going to... Well, why you, before he comes back, why don't you just give us a quick summary of the questions? Yeah. Because yeah. it's probably really not appropriate that we can simplify no. them. No, you know? no problem. Like a lot so, of these questions can be answered by David or whoever. Well, one of the questions anyway is about the charity work that he does do at the moment with... with with teenagers he works with juvenile mm. delinquents to get kids through sport to get them involved in sport and an idea I was going to put out to the group here and I might send it in an email afterwards we did we did speak to here he's back again we did speak to Javier would he like maybe to set up a GoFundMe page because we're doing this all for free here this evening and you don't have to you don't have to give but if anyone felt like contributing um it'll go straight into his account and he'll use the funds then for helping um, delinquents and drug addicts and and kids basically helping them through sport so i'll, I'll are you there you can translate that part to him nancy we'll, we'll talk about firstly ask well, him I'm how much time he has left he's back here bienvenido okay. soto one of his ask him how much time is he does he need to leave now and then we'll talk about the, yeah, his one minute we've got to wrap it up for him seriously yeah I, ask him there nancy well, si te tenemos uno o dos minutos más, ¿está bien? Dile que no hay problema. No problem, no problem. Um, so, I'll, will I say the stuff about funding and then ask him the question? Mm -hmm. yeah? Okay. Pues entonces, Olivia estaba comentándoles a los, um, los participantes aquí que del, del fondo que quiere establecer para quien quiera donar um, para el trabajo que, que haces con jóvenes en Cuba. Y entonces también quiere preguntarte si nos puedes eh, comentar un poco de ese trabajo que haces con jóvenes, con delincuentes, de tratar de, de ayudarles con, pues que se metan en deportes, ¿no? ¿Cómo es el Allá trabajo? Cuba, no, tenemos una comisión que le llamamos Comisión de Atención Atleta. Y ahí por lo general estamos eh, muchos de los atletas ya retirados. Y dentro de las tantas cosas que hacemos es ir a las escuelas, lo va a ir. De lo más, lo más que hacemos es ir a las escuelas deportivas. Pero igual atendemos, tratamos de atender a los familiares de los atletas, más que todo retirados, pero igual atletas en activo en la actualidad. Eh, cuando algún que otro atleta tiene problemas, eh, ya sea de salud o cuestiones eh, con la ley, que están presos, por supuesto, le hacemos visitas, le hacemos visitas también a sus familiares. Tratamos, dentro de las posibilidades económicas del país, ayudarlo en algunas necesidades materiales, más que todo, eh, para cosas de su casa, arreglos y tal. Y, eh, más que todo, también eh, con la presencia nuestra en competencias, en entrenamiento, eh, motivar a los niños a que hagan deporte. Muy bien. So, in Cuba, um, we have a commission, uh, and a rough translation, a commission to, um, for the, atten to the attention of athletes. Um, probably not the best translation. But basically, many retired athletes um, form part of this commission. And the work of this commission is to... Uh, mainly visit sports schools. So they have schools dedicated obviously to um, sports. Um, and also we help out with the families of the different athletes that might need um, some support if basically um, either an athlete has a health problem and we might be able to help out. They even have done um, prison visits to some athletes who are in prison 
in Cuba um, and basically offer support to the families of these uh, athletes that are in prison, therefore for providing mostly uh, material needs for these families who are in different situations um, economically. Uh, but principally really to as well motivate kids um, to really get into sports. Um, okay. There's a, Paul McKee wants to know, was Alberto Juan Torano a big um, influence on him when he was growing up? He's a Cuban athlete, I'd say. Yeah. Tenemos una pregunta de la audiencia. Quieren saber si Alberto Juan Torena fue una gran influencia um, para ti. Dile que sí. Cuando yo era pequeño, eh, que yo empezaba el deporte. En Cuba había tres grandes atletas. Juan Torena, eh, Silvio Leonard en 100 metros y Alejandro Casaña en 110 metros valla. Y creo que fueron los que me inspiraron a ser como ellos cuando yo era pequeño. Y creo que sí, él fue de los, de los que sí me motivó de verdad a, a tratar primero a ser de atleta, grande atleta como él. Y creo que tuvo que ver también un poco en mi manera de correr, porque él corría con los pasos muy largos. Y tal vez por eso también creo que, que desde pequeño también lo hice yo. Muy bien. Well, yes, most definitely, um, Alberto Juan Torena was a big influence for me. And when I was um, still small and just starting off in athletics, um, there was basically three big um, athletics, athletic names in Cuba. Um, there was Silvio Leonard and then Alejandro Valle um, in different areas of ath athletics. Um, and they definitely inspired me a lot in that first stage when I was young. But Alberto Juan Torena probably had more of an influence because he also had a similar running style to myself. So um, there was an extra connection there because he also um, did big strides. Very good. Nancy, can you ask him, how often did he, did he clear 240 or even higher in training? When he was training in the high gym, how high did he go raise the bar in training sessions? That's another question there. Pues otra pregunta del público es que quieren saber si, pues cuando estabas en, en, en entrenamiento, si alguna vez eh, lograste eh, saltar más de 240 o cuál, cuál ha sido como lo más alto que has saltado en momentos de entrenamiento. En entrenamiento 240 ni lo intenté. Nunca. <risa> nunca. Eh, nunca. En una o dos ocasiones 237. Y 235 era la marca la que me decía si yo estaba bien o no. En 235 hacía dos, tres, máximo cuatro intentos. Y en dependencia de cómo yo lo estuviera haciendo, eso me daba... Eh, la sensación de que cómo yo iba a, saltar, este, iba a saltar la próxima competencia. Si yo saltaba 35 en dos o tres ocasiones y lo hacía técnicamente bien, yo sabía que en la competencia iba a saltar como mínimo 240. Ah, muy bien. Qué interesante. Well, he never jumped 240 in training. Um, the maximum he ever managed in training sessions was 237 um, Only. but usually um, he used like 235 was his marker so when he'd do a couple of tries and he'd get to 235 234 attempts and he, he could get that it was he knew then he was jumping well at that point so if he knew in training he could get to 235 he knew he could probably do 40 240 in competition Amazing, amazing. Good to know. And um, and Tone, Dave Sweeney here, our National Fields Events Coach uh, Coordinator, wants to ask a question. You might have to unmute. Oh, you're unmuted, Dave. Yeah, off you go. Yeah, yeah. He has his own translator. Hello, Timo. Hello, Timo. Hello, Timo. No, Javier, Javier, uh, uh, 
dos, dos cosas. Uh, en nombre de todos de los entrenadores y atletas irlandeses, es un honor uh, tenerte aquí con nosotros esta noche. Uh, so, so muchas gracias por todos. But, uh, en segundo, uh, ¿prefieres uh, salsa o salta de, de alta? <laughs> No, prefiero saltar. Pero bueno, el año 2001, año 2001, cuando yo sabía ya que iba a retirarme, como no estaba convencido de que iba a ser entrenador, hice un grupo de salsa. Salsa Mayor es el nombre. Nancy. Nancy. Mayor, great. Oh, we'll check it out. She's, she's on the tea break. Oh, no, 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 no. I was last minute taking notes. Um, so the question was, so Javier, um, what do you prefer? Do you prefer salsa or to jump? Wait, no. <laughs> salsa or high jump? Yeah. yeah, obviously. Yeah, sorry. High jump, not just any old jumping. Um, so Javier says, I prefer the high jump. But um, and, then, he... and then I was sorry, I was just also saying just, uh, just on behalf of all the coaches and ath Irish, yeah, Irish coaches and athletes, It's an honor to have him here tonight, uh, just with us all, and just m many thanks for everything, you know, so. Yes, thanks, sorry, Javier. Yes. And then um, oh, go on. Oh, then, and that he'd formed, uh, I think when he was retiring, I think he said, he yeah. decided to form a salsa group, and he called it Salsa Mayor, which is like higher <laughs> salsa, maybe, something like that. Yeah, because he wasn't sure that he would be a coach or not, but. <laughs> yes, yeah, so he... he He had an alternative plan just in place. And Nancy, will you ask him, has he ever been to um, Ireland, to this little island? Javier, ¿sí se escucha, sí? Sí. Olivia te pregunta si alguna vez has podido visitar a Irlanda. ¿O te gustaría? No, me gustaría. Eh, he, he competido pero en los países nórdicos, pero no en Irlanda. Irlanda, lo que no recuerdo el nombre... En los años ochenta y tanto, había un saltador irlandés que eh, saltaba sobre los dos treinta, algo así, muy bueno. So, he said he would, he hasn't been, but he would definitely love to, to come visit Ireland. He has competed in other northern countries, but not had the pleasure of being in Ireland. But he wanted to remember the name of um, a good Irish high jumper who has achieved 230 but he, in the 80s. Adrian O'Dwyer, Adrian O'Dwyer. Yeah. No, in the 80s, Anton. In the 80s, 230. No, we didn't have anybody. Brendan Bre Riley. Brendan Riley. No. Brendan, the guy who, who, whose bed you woke up on. Disculpa, ahora, ahora me recuerdo, sí. Que ahora me lo están recordando. Competí en Belfast una vez, sí. Ah, he was in Belfast once for a couple of years. Belfast, okay. Ah. So well, look, been... you're very welcome in Ireland anytime. We have a performance enhancer called Guinness, and there will be a free <laughs> supply of this when you visit, okay? El Anton te invita para que vengas a, a Irlanda. Bueno, aunque él está del otro lado del mundo. Y cuando llegues a Irlanda, pues hay um, pues la especialidad para mejorar a cualquiera es la, la Guinness. Entonces, ahí um, te invitan te invitan abiertamente para que vengas cuando puedas. Ya, y a conocer que ya el Che estuvo por aquí, entonces ya toca venir. Vale, seguro. Gracias, <laughs> Javier. <laughs> or else we'll come visit him in, in Cuba, tell him. We'll all come. Yeah. So, ahí te, ahí te vamos a caer a Cuba, a visitarte también. Ah, para, yeah. Por ahí no lo esperamos. Salsa, salsa, salsa me Javier en Cuba, ya, yeah? una vez. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Gracias a ustedes. Sí, muchísimas gracias. Ha sido un placer yeah. absoluto. Vale. Yeah. Ahora, Muchos abrazos. Mira, al final se comportó mejor, la, la conexión se, come, se comportó mejor al final. Sí, la conexión fue un poco mejor al final. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a sign the party's only getting started, tell him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ya que I, I'm la, up for it, yeah, I'm up for como it. Como empieza la fiesta, ya se mejora la señal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing all nighter like he did in Liverpool, tell him. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Ahí para que te quedes, pierdo toda la noche como en Liverpool, de fiesta. 
Vale. <risa> Te vemos en Cuba, Javier. Vale, en Cuba. Vamos nos vemos. a tu grupo de salsa a bailar un poquito. We'll all go vale, salsa sí. in Cuba. Vale. <risa> chao, chao. Muchas, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Chao. Excellent. So, Nancy, you've been tremendously helpful. Thank you so much. I know that was above and beyond what you imagined. So that was amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I hope my non-technical vocab reached out to all levels. <laughs> Nancy, you were you were you were fantastic, Nancy. It was absolutely brilliant. You were very good. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Yo no podría hacerlo mejor. Well, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult. But he he had a good pace for talking too, so that, yeah. that was good. Because yeah. the Cuban accent can be quite a thing. Yeah, it can be it can be difficult, and also the way they talk sometimes. I, there are some things I don't understand if it's Spanish, but sometimes I, it's difficult to me to understand what they're saying. So yeah, first yeah. time in Cuba, I had like a three second delay in my brain till I got what yeah. they were saying. <laughs> but no, I think he well. It's so true. He's uh, he's used to obviously as well talking internationally, you know. So yeah, he's got a good. Pace. He was very good, very nice. Yeah, well, so. nice. Thanks. It was Thanks. fun. I learned lots. <laughs> <laughs> and if you've got a bed to stay in in Cuba now, Nancy, we're sorted. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> come yeah. you, so. Definitely. Hopefully, I can go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pandemic. Yeah. That's us. Well, if anyone's going to produce.